What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. In this one, it's transfer tips for game week 34. So I'm going to go through some of the players that people are bringing into their squads or taking out and talk through whether they are good moves or not, including some players where I just don't think there's a rush to bring them in for game week 34 specifically. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. Let's get into it. All right, let's start with Ollie Watkins, who continues to make myself and others look pretty stupid every single week because we've sold him. They had difficult fixtures coming up, like Arsenal away, and he goes and scores again. Uh, I need to double check, actually, what points did he get this week. So there's a seven-pointer for his one goal, and against Brentford in game week 32, it was a 13-pointer. So 10 points per game over the last two game weeks. And now he's got Bournemouth at home in game week 34, which has caused over 70,000 managers to bring him back in ahead of that fixture and then presumably for the rest of the season they're just going to hold on to him because it's Chelsea at home in 35, Brighton away in 36, Liverpool at home in 37 and Palace away in 38. Now it's difficult to sit here and say he's not worth the money because he's on 19 goals this season without penalties and look he's certainly not a bad option in FPL. I don't think anyone that sold him thought he was bad for what it's worth. I just think at the time he was injured plus it was Man City then you had that Arsenal away game as well. It just so happens that he goes and scores. But we do only have three forward spots. So I think you need to think carefully about who you might want moving forward. I think with the Dublin 37, despite how poor Haaland might have been recently, he's a lock for most people. I don't see how you can go without Izak at the moment either. Again, they've got a Dublin 37 as well. They've got some good fixtures before that. The guy can't stop scoring. As long as he stays fit, I think, again, he's pretty much a lock for most people's teams, especially from 35 onwards. And then you've got one more free slot. Now, personally, on wildcard 35, I'm looking at Nicholas Jackson, which if I'd said that this time last week, people would have probably laughed, maybe a little bit less so after last night. He did really well. And obviously, they've got two double game weeks to come, Chelsea, from 35 onwards. That leaves no room for Ollie Watkins. So it really depends on. I guess who you're comfortable going without. Like, if you're just going for Watkins for one week only because it's Bournemouth for home and then you're going to ditch him, fair enough. But if you've got no chips, there's no point in bringing him in just to take him back out again. You might as well buy the striker that you're going to want long term. So I think when you think about who's got that double in 37, so forgetting about this week, Haaland, Isaac, Hoyland, Jackson, Jao Pedro maybe as well. And there's one team I'm forgetting, Spurs. We can forget about Spurs because... I don't think anyone's going to buy Timo Werner. If you want a Spurs attacker, it's probably midfielders. I just think, and maybe it's a little bit easier for me because I'm on wildcard next week, and so I can just take my pick, right? I don't have to worry about transfers in, transfers out, etc. I, I just don't see Ollie Watkins being the one, right? I mean, the fixtures that Villa have got, I don't think put up too much of an issue for them, right? Having to play Chelsea and Liverpool is not necessarily great, but they're both at home. They will both give up chances. And we know how good Villa are, you know, from an attacking perspective. I mean, all round, to be fair, but especially from an attacking perspective. But they do also have Europe to contend with as well. So a lot of it will probably come down to how quickly top four gets kind of wrapped up. And it's quite close at the moment. I think Spurs are only three points behind Aston Villa and they've got a game in hand. So you would assume that Ollie Watkins will continue playing every single match. So I don't think there is a huge issue there, to be fair. And then the two away games of Brighton and Crystal Palace, again, they're not that difficult. So, it, I, I don't know, I just find this difficult for FPL because I definitely can't sit here and say that he's a bad option because he's clearly not, right? Everyone can see that. You don't need me to tell you. But I just don't see me buying him for, for the rest of the season. I said that when I sold him. He's just probably not going to come back into my team. I think Isaac and Harden are definitely in. And then you've got one more spot. And I would rather have a double game weekend. And also... As much as the fixtures for Villa aren't that bad, they don't they don't worry me either. If that makes sense, like Watkins could easily go and score braces in any of the, any of those games. I get that, but they also they're not so good that I'm worried about not owning them. If it was Bournemouth at home, Sheffield United at home, Burnley away, Luton at home, then it'd be a whole different conversation. But I just hope that with the fixtures they've got, the amount of points he can get will be kept down to kind of a minimum. And if you look at the other players that I've mentioned right so take Hoyland for example the fixtures that Man United have got you know it's Burnley at home in 30 it's Sheffield United at home this week to be fair then it's Burnley at home in 35 Palace away in 36 then you've got the double I just think I would take that as a punt now Watkins is low owned right it's worth saying that especially with you know top 100k engaged managers his ownership's actually going to be quite low because a lot of people would have sold him recently so it's not that he's this mega high owned player that you need to go against 
But someone like Hoyland's even more differential, and you've got that extra fixture, and you've got better fixtures before it as well. Do I think Hoyland is a better FPL pick than Watkins in terms of you know how good he is? No. But I think I would take the risk with the fixtures that they've got plus the additional one. And it's similar with, you know, someone like Nicholas Jackson, who has been frustrating to own this season. But 35 is a double. Villa away, Spurs at home. I think they'll get chances in both those games. Then it's West Ham at home in 36. And then in 37, it's Forest away and Brighton away. And it's Bournemouth at home to end the season. So I quite like Nicholas Jackson. I think there's an issue maybe in bringing him in this week because he's still only one yellow card away from a suspension. But as long as he can get through Arsenal away, he'll be fine. That's when the threshold goes up. But yeah, I, I don't know what to say, really. I, don't, I mean, I, yeah, you want to buy him, you should absolutely buy him. But can I see myself doing it? No. And will I continue to look stupid for the next five game weeks? Probably. All right, let's talk about another forward, this time Ivan Tony, And anyone that's kept hold of him up until this point must be extremely frustrated because in game week 32 against Aston Villa away, he was on the bench, comes on for nine minutes. Then it seems like he's probably going to be okay for Sheffield United at home in game week 33. Great fixture on paper. And what happens, he's on the bench again and he doesn't come on at all. Now, Thomas Frank has said that he should be okay for game week 34. At least that's what he seemed to indicate. But at this point, it feels like you're in a loop of just hoping that he'll start. And it just doesn't necessarily feel worth it. Like if we were in a situation where Tony had been playing 90 minutes the last few games, banging in goals, you could probably make a case to just keep him for the rest of the season, especially if you've got no chips, because the fixtures for Brentford from 34 all the way to 38 are pretty good. But I just don't think at this point there's really too many good reasons to hold on to him. Like maybe if you haven't got chips or you're not wildcarding until 35 and it would take a hit to get rid of him, you could maybe justify holding him. But as I've just spoken about with Watkins, there's only three forward slots. And I just don't think you need this constant kind of worry in your life. There's better forwards out there. The other thing that I've thought about, but I'm not sure it's actually a thing, but I'm going to mention it anyway, is are they protecting him more than they usually would? Like in terms of being in the Premier League next season, Brentford should be fine at this stage. I don't think anyone's expecting them to get into a relegation fight. And it has the thought has crossed my mind that maybe they already know he's leaving this summer and they don't want to put that in jeopardy. Because ultimately, anyone that's looking to buy Ivan Tony doesn't need to see him for the last four or five games, right? They already know how good he is. And he is going to feature. I'm not expecting him to miss them all. But maybe they're just being extra careful with him before they sell him because I think for a while now most people have expected Tony to leave Brentford at some point it seems like it's getting to that stage this could be the summer not guaranteed I'm not actually sure where he would go might discuss that on my um, other channel at some point but uh, yeah that did cross my mind as well but ultimately I think he'd probably be back for Luton away based on what Thomas Frank has said obviously keep an eye on what he says in the press conference on Friday because last week he said something like everyone who was available the previous week is available again and i did say on final thoughts presumably that includes tony even though he was on the bench and so maybe we need to pay, pay closer attention to what thomas frank actually says but ultimately i think it's probably a good time to get rid if you need a double game week forward then you've got solanke is probably the top option you could go for mateta or Cunha, maybe darwin nunez if you want to risk the minutes and if you're looking for a long-term pick you could go for watkins but i would buy Isaac if you don't know i think he just looks obvious but yeah ivan tony's time in our t in people's teams has probably come to an end i just think it's just too frustrating at this point but here's the thing if he does play the last five games which is definitely possible like, like i said i don't think he's going to miss out loads just because of a possible transfer i wouldn't be surprised if he goes and gets four or five goals maybe an assist in that time as well he's good for bonus he probably actually do all right he's going to frustrate owners even more when they sell him because he probably will go on a run so phil foden is another player that's missed the last two games but if i was someone that owned him I don't think I would be too hasty about selling him because I think he's going to be one of the most popular midfielders from now until the end of the season. Obviously, your chip strategy, as always, will play a big part into what your moves are this week. If you're dead ending into game week 34, then wildcarding in 35, then I don't mind selling Foden and bringing someone in with a double game week then to get him back for 35 onwards. But if you're someone without chips or someone that's already kind of wildcarded, I'd probably keep hold of him because... It's Brighton away this week, then Forest away in 35, Wolves at home in 36, so pretty good fixtures. Then you've got the double in 37, and West Ham at home to end the season. Is he going to play all of those games? Probably not. But I think even if he misses one, he's still got five fixtures over the last five games. I think he's done enough this season to show he's a great FPL option. I'd probably lean more towards holding on to him, unless, of course, like I've said, you're dead ending. In terms of 
the recent games against Palace in game week 32. I think that was just a rest because of the fixture congestion the Man City had. We saw that Haaland and De Bruyne got rested in the Villa game. It was Foden's turn against Crystal Palace. Against Luton, I'm less sure that was just a rest. I think it might have been because of the knock that he picked up against Real Madrid. It can't have been that bad, which I think is a good sign because he was on the bench. But they have the second leg of that Real Madrid tie to play this Wednesday. So I suspect he was probably just saved for that. And that's also another nice thing if you own him. You'll get to see that match before you have to make any decisions. And if he plays and he comes through unscathed, I'm sure he's going to start the next game against Brighton. Because at the moment, Phil Foden is clearly in Man City's best 11. So I would wait and see what happens against Real Madrid. I don't want to go too much into the leak stuff because I already spoke about it on the knee jerk stream on Sunday. At the end of the day, people are just trying to help us with the information they have. And most of the time it's correct. And most of the time it's really useful. So I wouldn't go kind of giving people that, you know, give that information grief or anything like that. It's really up to you whether you want to trust it. And if you think it's going to be wrong going forward, then it's quite simple. Don't listen to it. The interesting thing is uh, Pep has actually spoken about leaks in his press conference, which was funny. And he said Phil Foden was never due to start. People are still adamant that it was a late change. I don't know, right? But all I can say is on the deadline stream, I did get a message, which I mentioned, to say that Phil Foden doesn't start. It was just before everyone started saying that he was in the 11. I just didn't trust it enough to say, no, he's not playing. I kind of, I did talk about that on stream. Right? I didn't keep it to myself or anything like that. So I don't know whether it was a late change or not. But what I do know is I think that's a good thing moving forward, not the leaks and stuff like that. But if it was a late change, then he was close to starting. And that means whatever injury or he picked up against Ramager just can't be any kind of, you know, proper issue. And I'm almost certain he's going to start against Real Madrid this week. Therefore, he's fully fit, you would say, or at least as close to it as he can be. And therefore, he's a good option moving forward so yes the leaks were wrong yes that is frustrating if you didn't get anyone good off your bench and you were going to sell phone obviously it's annoying but these things happen right and most of the time you've probably made good use of that information would it be better if leaks went completely and none of us got any information absolutely in an ideal world but i just don't think that's necessarily um going to happen so we just have to you know take what we get and decide whether to use it and if you think going forward this is just too much incorrect information then you can just ignore it but I do think it's a good sign for Foden going forward that he was on the bench and he was maybe close to starting and I do like the fixtures that Man City have for the rest of the season and I'm not saying he's a lock on my wild card in 35 but he's pretty close to it I don't see me going without him even though I'm probably going to bench him against Forrest away because of the rest of the players that I'll have but I think for a home game in 36 a double in 37 and a home game to end the season I think that looks pretty good the only maybe reason why you could not go with Foden or, or my, why you might not want to do it is if you think the league is going to get wrapped up pretty quickly. Because if that happens, and Man City is still in Europe, there will be rotation. We saw that last year, right? Ortega started playing, Alvarez started playing up front. Foden will get a rest if the league is done, and they're still in Europe. But that's not over yet. Like I, you know, I spoke about this on a video yesterday. I think Man City will now go on and win the league. But it's how quickly they can do it. If Liverpool and Arsenal don't drop any more points in the short term, they're going to push Man City, and they'll have to keep playing their strongest squad so as it stands i really like him as we get closer to 37 if the league looks a bit different and city have got it kind of won then maybe we have this conversation again but ultimately i just think foden's great so unless you're dead ending i think about holding on to him so there's been over a hundred thousand transfers in for fabian share this week which goes to show just how quickly things can change in fpl because a few weeks ago we're talking about how many chances newcastle are giving up they're a good defense to target they got lots of injuries all of a sudden, it's back-to-back -back clean sheets. He's also scored as well, got a 13-pointer against Spurs. And now, like I said, there's 100,000 transfers in. Now, to be fair, part of that is because of the fixtures coming up. So it's Palace away this week. Then it's Sheffield United at home in 35, Burnley away in 36, a double in 37, of Brighton at home and Man United away. I'm not sure whether there's a clean sheet in that double, but I just see that as a bonus on top of the good fixtures before. And then it's Brentford away to end the season. So I actually quite like the idea of bringing in a Newcastle defender. Do I think there's a rush to do it in game week 34 against Crystal Palace away? Not really. I would expect Crystal Palace to score in that game. But from 35 onwards, they look great. And potentially, this is a downgrade, right? People might be downgrading a more expensive defender to get money for another move. So I don't mind it as preparation. But I think for a lot of people, there's definitely no rush to bring in Fabian Share for game week 34. Unless you're wildcarding, maybe, but I also don't think it's a great week 
to wildcard. But again, maybe that's a conversation for a different video. But in general, longer term, I like Newcastle defenders. And I think I said this last week, and I don't usually talk about previous predictions, or at least I try not to do it too much. But I think I said that Fabian Scher is basically Newcastle's Gabriel. Like Scher and Dan Byrne, they can both score from set pieces, just like Gabriel and Saliba can. But Gabriel is the main goal threat, and it's the same for Fabian Scher at Newcastle. And if you've got the cash, he is worth that extra. Does it mean that he'll absolutely, or sorry, definitely outscore Dan Byrne before the end of the season? Of course not, right? This is football and FPL. Predictions don't always go right. But if you've got the money, Fabian Scher is the one that's going to provide that main goal threat from set pieces. But he's 5.6 million now. He's not cheap. And you compare that to Dan Byrne at 4.5, big difference, 1.1 million, especially for a defense that a few weeks ago, like I said, we didn't even want to target. So I think it really comes down to what your next few kind of transfers are and what your long-term plan is in terms of which players you want in your team. If you can afford to go for share and still make all the other moves you want to do, get in all the players you want, then he's absolutely the right choice. But if not, I think I would just save the 1.1 on Dan Byrne because he's going to pick up exactly the same amount of clean sheets. They're both pretty much nailed on now, you'd think, for the rest of the season due to injuries. It's just whether that 1.1 million is worth paying for the goal threat. And look, I think with the way Salah is playing at the moment and his returns, more people are going to be... There's going to be more people that talk about selling him than maybe would have done a few weeks ago. Like I've said for a while on my wild card in 35, I won't have Salah, and that still looks to be the case. But people without a wild card might have been thinking about holding him through. I think a few less people will be thinking that now. Once you get rid of him, money is a lot more freely available, right? It's a lot easier to build your squad. But if you want to keep him or you don't have high team value, money could be tight. And so Fabian Share just might not be worth that extra. So I wouldn't go out of my way to buy him this week but from 35 onwards i quite like a newcastle defender and share is the one if you've got the money unless of course trippier suddenly returns in which case he could be worth it but right now he's injured and i'm not sure when he's going to be back so let's stick to newcastle and talk about anthony gordon next he's had over 160,000 transfers in this week which is probably no surprise considering he's just put up a 17 pointer against spurs and i think the conversation for him is exactly the same as it is with Fabian Scher. Is he a really good long-term option? And I say long-term, right? There's only five game weeks left, but you know what I mean. Until the end of the season, is he a good pick? Absolutely, with the fixtures that Newcastle have. He's only 6.1 million. He's absolutely nailed on to start. His minutes are good as well. Even if Newcastle started getting players back from injury and there was changes in that front three, it wouldn't be Gordon that came out, right? He would just move the left wing and Barnes would probably go back to the bench. But right now... That combination of Barnes, Isaac, and Gordon is working really well. And that probably is their best uh, front three. And I don't think Gordon moving from the left to the right has really caused any issues in terms of goals and assists either. So I really like him. I just question whether there's this rush to bring him in this week. I'm trying to think of what FPL managers might be bringing in Newcastle players. And I can only assume it's people without chips. That, that has to be it. You know, someone needs to make a midfield change. They want someone from now until the end of the season. Anthony Gordon looks like a good option. They've got the double in 37. I don't mind that move, but there's no way you would have him on a free hit. And if you've got your wild card left, you're probably using it in 35. In which case, why wouldn't you bring in a double game week for 34 instead of Gordon? Like Gordon's a great pick, but he's not better than Eze or Elise or Sarabia or Havertz or Odegaard or Saka, etc. that have all got doubles this week. I know there's a bit of a difference in price, so maybe that's playing into it as well. In which case, fair enough. I certainly don't, hate Anthony Gordon being brought in this week it just doesn't seem like the right time game week 35 seems like a much better option even to the point where I would be tempted with no chips to just punt the doubler even if it means an extra transfer for game week 35 and just hope that you get lucky again I don't mind people bringing him in of course not right he's a really good pick but I just feel like there's better options this week so long term great I think he'll be in a lot of people's wild cards in game week 35 I don't think he's a lock by the way because there's a lot of options in that week and we'll talk about it a bit more in game week 35 but i think that performance against spurs the fact that his home record's so good it's sheffield united at home in 35 one of the games in the double is at home as well and burnley way is a great fixture means he's going to be super popular and that ownership is going to absolutely soar which don't think there's necessarily a rush to get him in this week so people are buying man city defenders again this time it's vardy which is probably unsurprising after his goal and assist against luton at the weekend which was really nice for anyone that owned him especially after man city found yet another way 
to concede, this time against Ross Barkley. And look, my opinion of Man City defenders never really changes. In theory, they should be great because apart from Arsenal, they're the next best defence in the league. They don't give up many chances. They should get more clean sheets than they do. But the reality always seems to work out differently. They just end up being frustrating. And I think that a lot of FPL managers can't cope with that frustration. It's either that they concede a goal they probably shouldn't, there's that lapse in concentration, and they win the game comfortably, but they still find a way to concede. Or if that doesn't happen, your player gets rotated. And then there's a lack of kind of attacking threat as well, which I know sounds really stupid after one of their defenders just got a goal and assist and Rico Lewis scored the game before that. I'm not saying they can't get attack and returns, but it's not to the level of like, you know, a Trippier, Cher, Gabriel, you know, Trent and players like that. And I appreciate they're more expensive a lot of the time. But when you've got the worry about rotation on top of that, and then the ability to always seem to find a way to concede a goal, it just never feels worth the headache. And the one thing I would say about Vardiol is Ake was back on the bench against Luton, and that is competition for his place. Now, they can play together, right? You could have something like, you know, Carl Walker when he's back, then Ruben Diaz, then Ake, then Vardio as well. But when John Stones is fit, he's usually in that first choice centre back partnership. You've also got a Kanji as well. Diaz is getting a lot of minutes. If Vardio and Ake are just playing for left back, there is going to be a bit of rotation there. If you're buying a Man City defender, it cannot be with the expectation they're going to play every game because I don't think any of them will. And a bit like Newcastle players, there's no real rush to bring them in this week for Brighton away. Could you go for? A Man City defender on wildcard in 35, quite possibly. Is Vardio the best option? Debatable, maybe. But I think with Ake getting fit, especially if he gets minutes against Real Madrid or, or even next weekend against Brighton, I think going forward there is just that, it's just that headache every week. And, and I see it from kind of, you know, I, I speak to a lot of analytical managers that love the Man City defence. But even they, right, every single week, it's like they're discussing, is this player going to play? What's the back four going to look like? And I think just they're just not worth, in my opinion, that that much hassle. I might go with one in the end because there's just a lack of options on wildcard 35. But I just feel like I don't need that. I don't need that constant worry about whether they're even going to play. And then when they do play, they always end up conceding. Okay, Vardio went and got the attack and returns. But had that not happened, had you had Ruben Diaz or... Rico Lewis, whoever, you come away with no points against Lewin. It's just frustrating. So, like I keep saying, in theory, Man City defenders should be great. The reality always seems to find a way to not be like that. And I think for a lot of FPL managers, they can't deal with that frustration. So, anyone that brings him in, as soon as he gets benched, they're going to want to sell him again. It's just not worth it. I think there's better options out there, especially for game week 34. Again, it's a bit like, like I said, with Newcastle, like Brighton away is an okay fixture. But, you know, it's nothing special to get excited about. There's no double game week there until 37. I just don't think there's a rush to bring them in. Obviously, wait and see what happens against Real Madrid. Maybe it'll be a case that, you know, another defender plays and gets injured and that kind of narrows down the amount of competition there is for places. And if Ake ended up being out for another little while, I would definitely be more interested in Vardil. But when they're both fit, I just think there's, there's issues there. So, you know, I don't think Man City defenders are bad. I just don't see any of them playing all the games. And then when they do finally play, you're just hoping for that clean shit. Oh, I don't know. I just if I if I go to put a Man City defender on my wild card in 35, please remind me about what I've just said there. I may still end up doing it, but I should at least be reminded and I can't have any hindsight when it goes wrong. Let me know what you think about Man City defenders in the comments below. If you've enjoyed that video, give it a like and hit that subscribe button. Rate five stars if you're listening on podcast. And I'll be back tomorrow with the game week preview. So any players I've not covered or any, you know, topics and, and questions that have not been covered, you know, you can get them in on Twitter later today and uh, I will try and get through them tomorrow. Otherwise, I'll leave it there. Thanks for watching. And I'll catch you again soon.